Hey everyone, it is uh, George Kuros. We are actually just starting the season three of iMOOC and we are live with Katie Martin and Joe Bowler and I'm super excited. I know lots of people um, are actually watching right now and are gonna be jumping in right away. And so uh, we're really looking forward to a brand new season with iMOOC, uh, people already uh, sharing blog posts uh, on the notion of innovation education. Uh, their thought on the innovator's mindset. And uh, I'm going to just introduce uh, Katie Martin first. Katie Martin has been my co-host for the first two seasons, and she's graciously joined again uh, on the third season. And every time we try to tweak it up a little bit. And so, Katie, if you can just introduce yourself. All right. Welcome, everybody. We are, again, so excited to see everybody here. There's been lots of excitement around this next round, lots of people asking about it. So we're glad to finally get started. Um, I am Katie Martin, as George said, and really excited to um, engage with everybody and connect with some of the new people this week. And more excited to connect with a lot of our guests that we have lined up for the live show. And um, as most of you know, our guest today is Joe Bowler. And we are thrilled to have her here, the author of Mathematical Mindsets. And she's impacted so many of us. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe to give us a little bit of background on who she is and a little bit of her work so we can um, get started. Thanks. Dr. Bowler, let, yeah. Um, so I am um, a professor at Stanford, a professor of mathematics education, and I've um, got three different online courses that are available. My first one, How to Learn Math, was originally a free course, then Stanford started charging for it. Um, we have a free student course, also called How to Learn Math, to get ideas out to students. And my newest one is called Mathematical Mindsets, um, which also goes with a book I have, also called Mathematical Mindsets. And um, after that first online course came out, I was kind of swamped with people saying, can we have more, please? Keep giving us more of these ideas. So we started U-Cubed, which is a center at Stanford and a website a couple of years ago. Um, we just passed 21 million visits to U-Cubed last week. So that's going really well, and I think teachers and others are really excited about the ideas we're putting out there. And on YouTube, we have a, a whole range of things. There's online courses you can sign up for. There's tasks. Uh, we have a week of maths to start the school year each year. Um, and there's parent resources. There's things that students can engage with. There's lots of ideas. And um, so that's our online presence. And then we also do a lot of face-to-face. -face. I spend the whole year really going out working with teachers, which I love to do. We have teacher workshops at Stanford where people come here, and we also go around districts and do lots of work with people. So we're trying, as I say in our emails, to start a math revolution because there's so many new exciting ideas from brain science and other research about how to teach maths well. And it Kind of, it goes against a lot of the traditional practices that have been in schools for a long time. So, um, yeah, that's a bit about me. And and Joe, like I actually had the honor of uh, keynoting uh, the same conference mm -hmm. um, with Joe at uh, Q in California, and um, I actually had heard of her work prior, but I also read her book. And I think one of the things that really stuck out to me, and and, and honestly, like. Joe was just doing this out of the goodness of her heart and uh, today and just giving her own time but I am not I would never uh, say something if I didn't mean it like her book is so powerful and I would not consider myself a math person which is what I loved about it is that it actually was something that connected to all education and so I just want to ask you like real quick like like outside of the math community kind of what some of the feedback you, have you been getting on the book because I, I, I absolutely loved it yeah. and, and like I don't even say I'm not a math person anymore because of your book. <laughs> That's right? great. I feel guilty yeah. if I say that now. Yeah so the book has been a hugely read by a lot of people it's um, really you know a lot of people read it and nearly all the teacher feedback I've had from people is this is not just about maths like maths teachers read and say oh my gosh this has to go to other teachers and parents, and it's right, it isn't just uh, about maths, and a lot of the ideas about how to teach really well really apply to all subjects, um, which brings up the fact I just agreed to a new book um, that I'm working on now, which is 
taking the ideas across all subjects and to all teachers um, because I've listened to people who've read the book and said this is not just about maths and so the new book will not just be about maths it'll be about everything well and I think subject. one of the I think one of the things that really resonated and actually uh, connects to the the work that I talk about in my book is the importance of making mistakes and how you treat that. So can you talk a little bit about that, like on how you actually view mistakes uh, in, in learning and, and their yeah. importance? And so one of the things I put in the book is the brain science that we have that tells us that when you make a mistake, that's really important for the brain. It's a time when your brain is very active and synapses are firing. In studies, they actually found, they, stud with, they have people doing tests with MRI scans that whenever they make a mistake, synapses fire, but when they don't, make a mistake when they get work right there's less brain growth less synapse firing so uh, it turns out mistakes are really good we want kids making mistakes in classrooms we want them struggling those are the best times for brain growth and um, we want them to embrace mistakes and feel really good about them so that's a turns out to be a huge change for kids most kids in the school system they make a mistake in math and then they think oh I'm not a math person and they give up They've been made to feel bad about mistakes. Many students are uh, punished for making mistakes. All sorts of bad things happen to them. So they don't have the idea that making mistakes is a good thing. And when you change that for kids and you start to celebrate mistakes and celebrate risk taking, that changes a lot of things for kids. And we've, I've had feedback from many teachers saying that single message that mistakes are good, that alone just changes the whole environment of maths classroom and you, so I on that point you talk in the book about um, that everybody can learn math and everybody can be a math person if they have the right teaching strategies so mm -hmm. can you share a little bit about that what, what are some strategies that when you work with teachers that you help them um, implement in their classrooms well to, for people to uh, embrace maths and love it and learn it it's less sort of about using particular stresses and more about letting go of some terrible myths that people carry around with them that hold them back. So one of those myths is the idea that you're either born with a math brain or you're not. Turns out that's not true. We have plenty of brain evidence. Nobody's born with a math brain. Nobody's born without one. Everybody's brains grow and change. I just walked from a Stanford class in a new group of undergrads who all come in believing you have a math brain or you don't. And I've been trying to shatter that idea for them. Um, so if you go around with the idea you have a math brain or you don't, and then you struggle with math, many kids just think, okay, I don't have a math brain, and they drop out, or they give up. Or So you have to get rid of that myth. That's a really important one. And then another really important one to get rid of is the idea that to be good at math, you have to be fast. That is communicated to kids through the terrible things that go on, like time tests. They think you have to be fast. Um, and if you're not fast, you're not a math person. So I share with people the reflections of amazing mathematicians who won the Fields Medal. One of them is Lawrence Schwartz, and after he won the Fields Medal, he wrote an autobiography about how when he was in school, he felt stupid because he was the slowest in math. And so when you get rid of the idea that you have to be fast, when you get rid of the idea that you're a math person or you're not, Another myth we try and blow up is that maths is just about numbers and calculations. And we show the sort of visual, creative ways you can think about maths. Um, so with teachers, whenever I work with teachers, we actually get them doing maths differently. It's really, you really have to go through it. And I regularly have teachers crying in workshops, not because they're so unhappy, but because <laughs> <laughs> they sort of see this different maths and they, I, I get them to work on these patterns and color code them, and they come up with their own quadratic expressions. And you know, they spent their whole life thinking they couldn't ever come up with their own quadratic expressions. So it's kind of an emotional moment. And um, so it's it's a combination of a lot of things. I do think it's not just about saying different words to kids. You can't just tell them, Pat, you know, you have a math brain and mistakes are good, and then teach in the same way. Mm -hmm. It's really a combination of giving them good messages, but also giving them this sort of open growth, creative experiences. That is such an important point. And I think George highlights it in the book as well. But this notion, we can't just go around saying, failure's good, mistakes right. are good. And then, you know, calling on the first kid who raises their hand. Exactly. Um, 
Yeah. And so this shift is about language, but it's also about mindset and about obviously and about how we approach mm -hmm. kids. Yeah. Um, and so I know you've talked a lot about it and done a ton of work in this, but people ask me all the time, and I'm sure you, how do you just change somebody's mindset? Mm. So what are, what are your thoughts on that or how do you, how do you usually approach that? You know, I think in education we've worked for a long time to try and change practices and to talk about good maths practices and good teaching. But what I find really influential with people, even those with a very fixed idea about maths, is sharing the brain of them. Very hard to refute that brain of them. So I think it's really important for them to see that brains grow and change, to see the evidence of neuroplasticity to see the evidence about speed and anxiety. And um, I have had, I just had an interesting experience actually. I put on Twitter yesterday and on Facebook, I'm interested in people who've been really changed by brain science. And I was flooded with these reflections, many of them coming from teachers who said, you know, I used to talk about kids as high and low and smart and dumb. I used to expect them to do things fast or, or just think they were stupid. And I have just done a complete turnaround. I now value depth of thought. I don't talk about kids in those ways. I, so I know teachers can change. I know that it's about getting the knowledge um, that allows them to go through that change. The, the, one, of the, one of the questions, one of the questions, um, Joe, is uh, for Marissa Thompson, and she's just asking this, and I would love your thoughts because I know, uh, I know you reference Alfie Cohn in the book, and uh -huh. uh, uh, she asked the question, "What are your thoughts on the number of math problems being assigned as homework, and like, <laughs> and, and how you see that?" Yes. So I am not a fan of homework. I would gladly get rid of all homework. Um, schools. I know the research that shows that when schools get rid of homework, the achievement doesn't change. So it's not helping kids. Um, it is the biggest cause of inequity. The PISA team, the international PISA team, did a big report last year. Their big headline news was it's the biggest cause of inequity is assigning homework. Because, of course, the kids who have access to resources and other things at home are the ones who are more successful with homework. So, um, I, I mean, I have children myself. I, and like many parents, I see what it does to them. It is a time of stress. They come home, they're tired. I don't want to be doing hard thinking at that time of night, but I'm sitting trying to get my kids to do it. Um, you know, there's tears, there's stress, and for what? Usually, it's just do six more of those questions we did in class. Um, so yeah, I would very happily get rid of all homework if I could. But here, and here's something I find, and maybe this is like just in my experience, and like I'd love either of your thoughts on this, but I find that any research that we pointed to has never showed a positive impact of homework. No. Yet a lot of teachers that are very focused on research mm -hmm. are the ones who talk about homework and being yeah. important. And yeah. I, I, like, where is that disconnect happening? You know, it was interesting. One of our workshops just a couple of weeks ago, one of the teachers said that homework is a time when you can have a problem and you look at the answer. You can't do it. You look at the answer and you work backwards until you work out how to do it. And I want my kids to have that experience. And I said... Is that how you did your homework? You would find the answers and then work out how to do it? And he said, yes. And I said, because I don't think many kids do that with that. <laughs> I don't. And maybe if they were doing that, then it would be a good opportunity for them. But most kids just feel defeated with homework and they don't know. They've got no one around to help them. They don't know what to do. Are the, uh, really, the worst, one of the worst things, and I was shocked when I moved to the U.S. because we don't do this in England. I've never seen it before was when um, math classes start with a review of homework. And they spend 30 minutes reviewing homework. So not only is that a huge waste of time, but if you're the kid who couldn't do your homework because you have two jobs to do when you get home, you start class from a real disadvantage. Well, so, and, and, and people say we don't have time in class, but we spend time going over homework. And I just think that is... We need to, 
we go, yeah, but I think there was this real tension, and I appreciate you as a mom and an educator being able to say, homework is a pain to do at home, and right. I feel the same way, but people expect me to want more homework because I'm an educator, and I have parents that feel like they need to ask the teacher for homework because it looks more right. rigorous, and I just feel like that's a bigger conversation that we all need to be having to really push on why we're sending it home. Exactly. We should look at Finland, which is doing so well and has topped the world over and over. And one of the first change, Finland used to be really low performing. And then it went to be really high performing. And what was one of the big changes they made? They got rid of homework. And they decided these kids have to be treated like children. They have to have time to play. And I feel like my own children have no kind of family time. They both are on athletic teams, so they go from school to sports, they come home, they do homework all night, and then they go to bed. And then they spend all weekend doing more homework. And uh, it's an, kind of an affront to me that that time is taken away from us. And, and, and right. I, just, I just want to ask you, because there's something, it's actually fascinating, there's a, one of the people that's following along on Twitter, her name's uh, Sarah Gladson, and I apologize if I said your name wrong. She's actually listening to this conversation while doing homework with her second grader, right? <laughs> and so, like, this is not a practice that, for for whatever reason, uh, we teach it. Because, like, I, I like I actually believe that a lot of the my work ethic was not doing homework; it was actually playing sports and you mm -hmm. know being well rounded. But there's one thing I want I want to ask you because, and it was not actually one of our planned questions, but. A lot of teachers are talking about flipping their classrooms, and I know uh, I'm sure you've heard about this. And it's personally, um, I, I don't want to watch a video of my teacher at home. Like I don't, like I don't, I don't see the value value that, and then come into the homework at all the time. But because it's like homework, but it's just different, and and I understand that. Like, so have you? Like, I'm sure you've heard of the concept. What do you think about like that notion of like watching the teacher at home and and, and doing the the work at school? The only way I think that flipped classrooms are an improvement on what we have now is if people watch the lecture at home, which probably is not very exciting for kids, but then they do like really good project work and really good collaborative work in the classroom. I don't think that's happening very often. In fact, one of the essays, one of my undergrads I just read that are in my class said, oh, my math teacher had flipped the classroom and we would watch videos at home. And then in class, he would sit and watch football, and we would all sit around and talk. And I was like, hmm, that doesn't sound like a good use of flipped classrooms. But um, So I think it, it's possible you can have a flipped classroom and do be good, doing good things about it with it, but a lot of them aren't. And um, one of my doctoral students wrote a paper, actually, about this, about what's a good flipped classroom and what's a you know, not-so-good flipped classroom. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting point, is it's not flipped, it's not blended. We, we like to label a lot of things and think that that changes, but instead it's really about what are the conversations you're having with kids, how are you going to deeper in solving problems. And so I, I would love to hear more about you know, your thoughts on how you help teachers think about what type of problems that they're solving, and not just in math in general, but like, what, what, sh what should we be spending our time in class doing? Yeah. So um, one of the things the latest brain science is showing is the importance of brain connections. They've actually been on this long quest for a long time to work out what makes a genius. So they've brought people in. They've studied the brain of Einstein for many years, so they can't really see anything. Um, they've brought in living, day, everyday people they think of that are alive today as geniuses and watch their brain activity. And what they find is these people have more connections between different brain areas. No bigger separate areas, but more connectivity. So what brings about brain connections um, in maths, if you're only seeing maths numerically, that's one area of your brain. If you see it visually and you write about it with words and you draw it and you build it, this is what's causing brain connections. When you have a piece of knowledge that you see in all these different ways, so that, of course, applies to any subject, not just math. If you have multimodal forms of knowledge, engage kids in different ways and uh, not just the same way all the time. So it's not always reading in one subject. It's not always doing numbers in another subject. Um, that is really empowering. And I think my big advice that I give to maths teachers is 
Okay, throw out three quarters of your textbook questions and go deeply into the ones that are left. Think about them visually. Have kids discuss all the different ideas. What could it be? Um, get them to think creatively, come up with their own questions. So those are the kind of, the, the sort of advice I give. Awesome. And, and one of the, just one of the characteristics I talk about the notion of the innovator's mindset is actually the notion of being observant is actually taking something that you see in another area and applying for it. And I just kind of like, we're kind of in this culture of education um, where uh, a lot of administrators have told teachers like, you know, they've given them scripted classrooms. Like they can't even, there's no autonomy in the classroom or they're looking for, you know, they're, if you if you give them a, an amazing science example of something you teach, but you don't, but they teach math, they're not making the connection. And so, how how do you actually help teachers mm -hmm. make those connections to their yeah. to their work? Right? You see something like you know someone who's watch who teaches humanities who's watching this right now. How do they take your work and, and make those connections themselves? Not you do it for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're really sort of battling away with with policymakers is having teachers feel more free and more responsible for what they can do in the classroom. Like a lot of kids in math classrooms will say, I don't feel free, I feel like I'm in a box, I'm following rules. And we, we try to say to teachers, you know, have kids be free, have them think freely, creatively. But they don't feel free. They themselves are under these systems of following a pacing guide, which is like the worst evil in education. Um, <laughs> doing district tests, you know, having kids jump through hoops. So we have to free up teachers. And when they feel free and, ha and have them love their own subject, that's when they start seeing connections. And um, so we have to give them back responsibility. I feel like the last 15 years or so of the No Child Left Behind and all those acts um, have taken responsibility for teachers. Um, so many of them don't feel responsible and free in their own teaching, and that's such an important feeling. Well, so, and I think, uh, sorry, Katie, the, 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 the thing that I find really fascinating is innovation has become one of the biggest words in education, and administrators, administrators will say, hey, we want innovation, and here's exactly how you'll do it. And it's, so, yeah. it does a, it's, yeah. there's a, yeah. like it's, a, it's, you know, it's counterintuitive there. Yeah. Well, yeah, and to that, I was going to say to that point, like how when I know people are wondering when you're saying the pacing guides and free up teachers, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to speak for people who are saying, but the test, mm -hmm. but this. So what are your thoughts and how do you think about that? And to George's point about people are saying innovate like this. Mm -hmm. We want to control things so much. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts and how, how do we move away from that? That's not the right way to do it. We invited 81 students to campus a couple of summers ago. And the 81 students um, came from districts where we'd asked the administrators, can you give us kids who've had a bad math experience? And they said, oh, yes, we definitely can. So we had these 81 sixth and seventh graders. Every one of them on the first day said, I'm not a math person. They could name one person in their class. They thought it was a math person. Anyway, we taught them over 18 lessons, and we taught them to be creative and free and embrace challenge and they, we got rid of ideas you're a math person or you're not we did these wonderful deep problems um 18 lessons later they'd taken a state test before they came to us a district test of algebra we gave them the same test 18 days later and they improved by the equivalent of 1.6 years of school in 18 lessons that each kid improved by an average of 50 percent on the test now, we did not teach the content of that test. We worked on freeing kids up um, and having them just use their own thinking, their own minds, and not be sort of held down by these ideas that, that they're not a math person and they have to fill out lots of answers. But one of the big things the kids said in interviews after this camp was, I felt free. They said, in school, I feel like I'm in prison. They used the word prison. Um, I'm just following, we, we have to worship the textbook. The textbook's like the Bible, and you have to worship it. Um, so we've sh we're sharing these videos of the kids, we're sharing how, what we did with them, we're sharing our curriculum, and a lot of teachers will watch these kids and go, oh, this is so wonderful. 
I want this. I want this for my classroom. Mm -hmm. But then I've got the district test and I've got the pacing guide. And so this is why we're really working hard to try and educate the administrators and the uh, state people and the district people that we have to free up teachers. Thank you for that. So, and I think about when you say, you know, the teachers, when they free up the kids and don't focus on a test, but just to your point, they say, well, this is great, but then we have to do it instead of the test, and it's almost something on top of. Let's, let's get through the lesson, and then we'll do one project or one deep problem afterwards. Yeah. And, you know, you're saying, let's, let's do this. Let's get a, away from the, the really structured work and think deeper. It. I mean, we obviously had a lot of freedom in our summer camp here. We didn't have the district case guide and all that. But I, we work with teachers who do this in their regular classrooms. One teacher called Mark Petrie that I share a lot, um, he came to one of our workshops. He used to do the standard traditional math lesson. Um, the district measures of the kids, uh, of the amount of growth that they meant to show, he had 5 to 7% of his kids making that growth. He went back and he changed his teaching. Every Monday he shares a growth mindset video. He's very creative. He finds things off the internet and TV shows to illustrate growth mindset. And he started teaching differently. The following year, he had 97% of his kids meeting the district standard. So this is, a, this is something teachers can do, even inside the regular school with the district requirements. Um, but it's about teachers helping kids believe in themselves and helping kids engage sort of openly and creatively. Two points on that. And I think that it's so important you said having, you know, believing in kids. But I think we also have to help teachers believe in themselves. Absolutely. And they've experienced so much in their own education. A lot of teachers will say, well, I'm not a math person. I have to use this textbook. Yeah. Or... I, they don't trust themselves. Right. And I love how you brought up your student who is in, innovating inside the box, right? Like George talks about that a lot in the book, that you can't just break open boundaries and say, I'm not going to follow all the rules. We, we are held by expectations. But being creative and mm -hmm. changing the paradigm of how you talk to kids and the experiences right. that you provide for them within the constraints that were provided. Yeah. I mean, I, I mentioned I put out on Twitter and – I was interested in people who've been changed and gone through change. And we're going to, I, w I was thinking about them for my new book I'm writing, but we're going to publish many of these stories on our YouTube site because I have, I know, 50 teachers telling me, I went through this huge change. This is what I'm doing differently. It's so amazing for the kids. The achievement's gone up. Everybody's. Um, and these are teachers doing this in their regular classrooms with you know, all the constraints that teachers have to work within. So although I argue and try and push for more teacher freedom, I do think um, most teachers, unless they've got a really like, awful administrator, um, can make you know, a lot of change in their own classroom. That's a great thing about teaching. Right. And it, yeah, it goes back to believing in themselves and understanding yeah. what, what the we, learners need. We have a nation of math teachers, of course, of elementary math teachers who don't think they're math people. Who were, this is why we have so many of them cry in our workshops, because people made them think that, that they couldn't do that. And you have to change that. You have to have them think differently about themselves. It's hard to give kids a growth mindset if you don't have a growth mindset about yourself and your own learning. Well, I find that like uh, one of the things I talk about is we talk about the notion of growth mindset and innovator's mindset, and, and then I'll watch a teacher in a classroom and some technology doesn't work and they'll say right in front of their kids, I'm never doing that ever again. Okay, and right. they'll, they'll literally like give up through that process. Yeah, yeah. No, that's important. That just happened to me in the class I was in. Uh, we couldn't get the projector to work um, after a while and I was like, okay, I've got a growth mindset. We're going to make this work. So <laughs> I held up my laptop for them. Like everybody, <laughs> get the projector, I'm just going to hold the laptop up like this. <laughs> Uh, Joe, the, so a lot of the, the conversation, and I just want your thoughts on it, um, is, is talking about, you know, how your kids will do better in math. And, uh, you know, a lot of this is validating for, you know, teachers thinking differently about how they teach math. So if I don't go into a math field uh, mm -hmm. after 
uh, you know, my time in school. How does the work that you see actually, how do you see it impacting uh, our students as they walk out into the, the next phase of their lives if they're not in necessarily uh, the field of math? I think having kids understand that they can learn anything, this isn't just about math, but that's what the brain science is showing us, that you know you can form new pathways, you need to learn something, those brain pathways will form. And having kids know that, that they can learn anything, um, that they can think sort of creatively and deeply and make connections between things, those are things that people take through their whole life and changes everything they do. And one of the frameworks I share with teachers and my doctoral students here is a framework that comes from Etienne Wenger, who's a Swiss scholar. But he talks about how when you um, learn something, it changes your identity. It actually changes who you are as a person. Um, it's not just about accumulating more facts and information. It's about who you become and how you change. And when we give people different learning experiences, that changes them as people. It changes how they interact with the world. It changes how they have conversations. Um, it's pretty deep and really, uh, really important. So I don't think for a minute that when we make these changes for people, it means like higher math test scores. I mean, it does give them that, but much more profound change that's really important. And, and that's actually, I, I like, I really love that you said that, and this is the first episode of iMOOC. And, and the reason I love this is that this is a very different experience for a lot of people that are participating because we do these little conversations with educators and they really push thinking. Uh, but the people that have actually put the effort into doing something, and a lot of them are doing things that are making them extremely uncomfortable through this process, mm -hmm. I think has, has made a really major impact in the classroom. And you can see that yeah. in the comments. And so I think yeah. it's such a valuable message um, mm -hmm. to, to actually the group of people that are listening right now who had some, like uh, some people that are listening right now are going <laughs> to give up at some point because it's too hard for them, yet they'll expect their students to, yeah. you know, yeah. Russell through. And on that, I mean, one of the messages that I give to teachers is you need to make mistakes in front of your kids. Take risks, make mistakes, uh, make maths mistakes. If you don't make mistakes in front of your kids, how do you tell them that it's okay to make mistakes? And one of the problems kids have, have is they look at their maths teacher or any teacher and they think, oh, that's what being a math person is. You know everything, you never make mistakes, you're totally sure of everything uh, that's a terrible image to give kids and um, so one of the reasons some teachers don't try these more open creative tasks is because they don't know what will happen they don't know what kids are going to do and I say to them you know that is okay and if you one of your kids does something and you don't understand it great you can say to them that's really interesting I'm, I'm gonna have to look into that more I think I want to just highlight that because I think that's something we think we're teachers. We've made it. We have to be perfect. Right. And there's, this, there's this notion that like I have to have this perfect lesson plan and I'm going to go through it and you're going to say these things and I'm going to say these things. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't work out that way, there's this sense that we're not doing our job well or we're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. And I think we just need to keep pushing on that because if we don't have those conversations with kids, yeah. about making mistakes and not just like a fake make mistake yeah. but like actually taking a risk where you have the the possibility of something not working out I think is really powerful that's right and we're not gonna teachers aren't gonna try more creative open tasks where they don't know what kids will do unless they're comfortable with taking a risk and being uncertain and not knowing what will happen I think we've one line we've fed teachers for a lot of years is you have to have worked through every problem your kids do so you know exactly what they will do with it. That I don't agree with. I think it's great to have kids do things you've never seen before and say, wow, I've never seen that method. That's really cool. Oh, I've never thought about that. Well, and George points that out a lot is that you can't hold people back from doing things because you don't know it. So if we have to work through all the problems, have to have all the answers, how are we right. going to allow kids to ever surpass us and do better than what we currently know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, what, and, what, what, you, sorry, no, go, go ahead, Joe. No, no, go ahead, Joe, please. If you look to the future, what do we need adults doing when they leave school? They are going to be solving problems that nobody's even thought of yet. So Hopefully. training them to solve all of these set 
questions um, and not to think flexibly or adaptively is just going to set them up for failure, for not only for those kids, but for society as a whole. Yeah, one of the best experiences actually in my career and a lot of people don't know about is um, my first uh, my first job was a three month job and for some reason I, they, I was not a technology person and they actually had me teaching students technology and they had modules and things like that and I didn't know so all the kids and I would sit together and we would actually go through the problems okay. and they would once they found out the adults didn't know something they uh -huh. would go out of their way to say hey look I figured this out and they yeah. were like we're excited yeah, about it. yeah. And, and it was actually for me, it was hugely beneficial, but I didn't really understand at the time because I've never taught any way, like any way different because I, my first place was, I was probably the least uh, knowing person in the room, but they just, but I also would make sure nobody killed each other. So it was kind of like the, kind of the focus there. Um, so so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually, Joe, I'm gonna ask you a question uh, right away and it's actually the blog prompt um, so there's two questions I'm going to ask you, and it's the blog prompt that I've asked people to talk about, so I'd love your take on it too. Uh, but um, anyone, if you have questions for Joe, um, if you could write them in the chat on YouTube or tweet them to the hashtag iMOOC, uh, Katie and I will pull some for Joe before we end. Uh, so the, the first question I'd like to ask you, Joe, is innovation and education is, is obviously a big topic of this, of this open uh, course. Mm -hmm. um, what what would you why is innovation and in education why do you see it as crucial or if you don't you know either way why do you see, think yeah. that's actually important I think it is very important um, I mean the the curriculum we teach in schools now the system that we use in schools now is really developed amazingly in the 1800s and we in maths for example we set up a curriculum to help people be shopkeepers so they could learn to calculate and run shops and you know it turns out the world has changed quite a bit since that curriculum was developed but the school curriculum has not so um, we're training kids for something they don't need in mathematics um, we're training them actually most of the time we're training them to do what our phones and computer calculators do a lot better and we're not training them to do things we need them for like setting up models and thinking adaptively and changing methods and um, so it's very important that we bring about change. Now the other reason we need to bring about change, it's not just that we're teaching a curriculum that's not uh, really suitable for the 21st century but the other reason we need to change is we have widespread failure in schools and many many adults who do not feel good about all sorts of different subject areas and many people who um, leave school feeling pretty defeated. So even, I mean, I teach at Stanford, and half of the Stanford students feel that they don't belong, that they can't do it. Um, so we're giving kids these terrible messages, and um, we really want to change that because we care about students, and we care about them having a better experience than they're having now. I That's really like important to point out, and I think you said, Students at Stanford don't feel like they belong, and I think all of us would think that's crazy. You, we would yeah. think that they totally would. Mm -hmm. And pointing out challenges or what people are going through, I think, is is really helpful. Mm -hmm. so, and you've made a tremendous impact on, not only on math but on education in general, and we really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what are some things that you've gone through and you know that you that have kind of led you to this path to see how critical this is to shift education? So I can tell you something that happened to me that I don't talk about very often anymore, but I think is pretty important. And that is um, I published a study in England that showed that you know when kids engage more actively, they do better. I came to the US and I did another four-year study, same result, kids who engage more actively do better. I was attacked by very traditional mathematicians who um, wrote lies about me on websites, tried to discredit my research, accused me of scientific misconduct at Stanford. Now that is a serious claim. Stanford has to investigate it by law. Uh, so they started an investigation. They wouldn't even finish it because they said this is completely bogus, there's no reason, there's no justification. I had to give them all my data, it was very stressful. Um, 
But then these guys continued to publish their claims on all over the internet. I actually left the United States, went back to England, because I thought, this is so crazy. Um, but anyway, three years later, I decided to come back, and I thought, I've got to do something about this. So I published a website, and I just set out what these guys had done. I said, you know, I showed how they tried to discredit me, how, you know, these are guys who describe African-American students as picking innies. They're very dubious characters. And um, I wrote all this up on a website, and it was amazing that when I put it up on the internet, it was the most tweeted story in education that weekend. It had like 30,000 people read it that weekend, and it was all over the news. And, but over the years, I coming out about that and talking about it publicly has meant that there were lots of people, it turned out, in education who'd had similar kind of bullying experiences. Uh, from traditionalists trying to discredit their work, stop them going forward. And so telling that story turned out to be important to them. It helped a lot of other people who had bad experiences. And I also think it helped, um, like in the long run, it probably helped my message because it got a lot of people looking and paying attention to it. So now I feel like I should send them a little thank you note. <laughs> um, Honestly, Joe, like, I, I, I got anxiety listening to that. So I can't even imagine awful. when you it went through terrible. that. Yeah, I mean, for a long time, I felt terrible. And, you know, I really closed in. I was like, oh, God, this is terrible. I won't talk to anyone about it. But eventually, I decided, you know, I need to get this out and talk to people. And that turned out to be the great thing, communicating and talking to people. And now when I talk to conferences and other places about people who are bullied, I say, talk to other people about it. Do not turn in wood. Do not... Um, you have to go out there and be public, but um, I, now I look back at it and think this, you know, I've been, I've been through some bad times. People, uh, teachers go through bad times with bad administrators and others, and everybody has challenges, and I've had my own challenges. Um, and that's part of education, you know, getting through that. And, and what is really powerful, I think, like you have no idea how appreciative I am that you told that story and I know so many people that are commenting right now are just blown away by what you shared because uh, I think that resonates with a lot of people who are actually taking this course right now and that have any type of thinking that they share that's outside of the traditional knowledge yeah. Mm -hmm. You are guaranteed that someone will uh, will go yeah. after you yeah. and, and, and challenge you. And mm -hmm. like I always talk about the importance, like that you can let that bug you, but don't let it stop you from moving forward. Like if your focus is doing what's best for your learners and for children, then you need to to focus on that. And eventually, yeah. people come around. And no matter how like people get mad when other people do good stuff. Like, it's not because they agree, disagree with That's it. That's how just I've them. learned yeah. to, cause I, I constantly get this. Everywhere I go out and speak, I get pushed back. And I've learned to think of it that way. You know, if I'm not getting people disagreeing with me, I'm probably not being good enough in my teaching and in my message. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really important that we all, and, and it is to be expected in education. You're going to get people disagree with you. I read a really interesting story, actually. I just read a book on brain plasticity by a guy called Norman Dodge, who's a, a brain surgeon, physician. And he talked about how um, the early discovery of brain plasticity and the scientists who discovered it published it widely and got a whole no load of attacks from the establishment. People were you know, attacking him and trying to discredit him. Years later, when it became so established that actually brains aren't fixed, they're very plastic, these same people had to say, you know, I was completely wrong. I should never have written that to you. I should never have done that. But I just thought, gosh, it's like whenever you push against what's, you know, traditionally known, you get a low, you just get, will get a lot of pushback. So people who are innovative in schools are going to experience that. And I think it's really important just to know who, know who your friends are, keep connected with the people who are doing good things. That's a great thing about technology, that even if you're in a school where you feel isolated, there are other people that you can connect with, like through this MOOC and through websites. And um, you, you need those connections. You need those people to keep you going through sometimes. So I want you to publicly give me heck for something I used to do and tell me why it was horribly wrong. Um, so this is what I used to do with kids that struggle with math. And we'd have phys ed right after. 
and I would not let them go to Fizet until they finished their math. And tell me why that's, as someone who is like seen as one of the faces of math, tell me why that was horrible for me to do. Well, I would say that it's horrible because um, <laughs> math becomes like a punishment. It's like, um, it's a little bit akin to teachers who say, you've been bad in class, so you're gonna stay behind and do more math problems. It's like, you know, this is this nasty punishment thing that I'm gonna do. But I think um, the bigger question really is, there are some kids who will struggle. There are ki many kids that you might teach who haven't had those enriching brain pathway experiences. Uh, they can get there, they can catch up. But um, we have to not make kids who, you know, are in that situation feel bad about them and themselves and stopping and going to phys ed is pretty bad. Um, I, I don't do it anymore. I just want to make that clear. I know it was horrible. And now when you said when you said punish when you said punishment to me, I'm like, now if you made me go exercise, that would be punishment. I feel like so I totally get that. Yeah, that just makes yeah. sense for me. I, I really appreciate that. Um, Hold on, before you go into questions, I have one point to make. Um, and I just want to go, not circle back, but I just want to highlight um, what you guys, the conversation about adversity and facing challenges. And I think you said, Joe, that um, if you're not pushing people to disagree with you, that you're not doing your job. Yeah. And I think that's also a mindset shift yeah. that obviously you had to make through adversity, but I think that we need to also embrace as educators that it's not always um, getting to the right answer. It's not always thinking like me, and that's mm -hmm. a kind of a larger conversation that we could have in this country, but how we're thinking about um, thinking, how we're thinking about pushing people, challenging ideas, yeah. and, um, and if we're doing our job as educators, we're getting people to think differently and think about how to make connections, um, right. I mean, really, in teaching, if you're not open-minded enough to learn new ideas and be willing to be challenged, I mean, that is the ultimate mindset of a teacher. Thank you. Absolutely. And and just through your story, and I know George has shared many stories. We all have these stories. Um, mm -hmm. When you put yourself out there, people are going to challenge you, and and that's okay because yeah, you're, you're making you're making a difference and you're helping people think. But um, your story about publishing on your website and sharing your point of view, mm -hmm. um, I just want to thank you for doing that because you've changed the thinking for so many. And, you know, I guess George points out a lot too that um, making, making the positive so loud that you drown out the negative and really focusing on, on the messages we need to hear. And I just want to highlight that because everybody thinks, well, my challenges are different, or my adversity is different, um, and, yeah. and we all have different struggles. And I've learned a bit over the years that there are so many great teachers and so many teachers who believe in change and are willing to change. Work with those people. You know, if you've got this dinosaur who's saying, I'm not changing, this is what I'm going to do, just leave them and work with those great people because there are great people everywhere. And gradually, as teachers, you know, you work with the great people and you work with the people who want to change and gradually that gets shared more widely and even the people who are stuck in their box start to see something. The, the, when you say that, like, and I, I totally, like, there are people that are very stuck into it mm -hmm. and I think that a lot of people, I don't think any educator didn't want to like change the world when they first started and yeah. eventually along the way I don't think they you know just you know start hating stuff yeah. I think that I think that the, the system sometimes takes them down but we have to realize that we as educators are the system and we have to we can change ourselves and so here's a here's one of the questions and to be honest with you like I ask people for questions and then you started telling your story and then nobody asked questions because they were just so blown away by what you shared and I'm just so appreciative that you shared that. Uh, but I'm going to ask you uh, one question and then we're going to uh, shut down for the night. Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you think about grading in math? This is a question from Maggie uh, B. I'll just say because I'm going to say her last name wrong. So it's Maggie B. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you think about grading in math and, and yeah. how does that impact the learning? Great question, Maggie. Um, grading is something that we know is not very effective in education. It does not increase learning. It decreases learning. Students only have to think they're being graded for their learning to, to decrease. So um, 
Uh, it's a very fixed mindset message. You hear kids in the in the U.S. They don't even say. They don't even when they get a D or a B. They don't think, oh, this is uh, telling me what I did in this assignment. They start to think this is who they are. And you'll hear kids saying, I'm a B student. I'm an A student. I'm a D student. Um, so I don't think grade is a good idea. We know that there are much better ways to go. Giving diagnostic feedback is great. Um, it can be hard if you're in a system that requires you to grade. In my book, I give some like workarounds if you're in a system where they say you have to grade. Um, grade differently and grade on kids doing amazing things rather than getting answers right. But in my own classes at Stanford where we are required to grade, I start on the first day and I say, I'm going to give everybody in this class an A. I know the damage of grading, so everybody in here is getting an A. If you uh, start you know, not doing the work that we need um, in this class, then we'll have a conversation and I'll explain to you how you need to be doing that work. Nobody in that class thinks, oh, well, I'm just going to relax and do nothing. They have this huge weight lifted off them. They do amazing things. So um, if we could move away from grading as other, sub uh, as other countries have, I think that would be a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> that that's just like I, I remember actually uh, a professor said that to me uh, when I was in university in education, and we all talked about that person as being the craziest educator yeah. ever mm -hmm. when we first did that. And and now I look back on a lot of the lessons I got from that class and how he was so far ahead of his time uh, doing that stuff. And I, I worked harder in that class. Than I did in other ones, and we were driven by the learning and not by grade because we, yeah. we just wanted to get better. It's really fascinating. They're interested in learning. It's intrinsic motivation that always beats our extrinsic huh. motivation. And sometimes we just do things because we're used to it in this culture. You know, it's what we had in school ourselves. We just repeat it. So that's why you know research and finding out about other countries and things is really helpful. And, well, and shifting that experience for teachers, I think that's a huge point. You know, they they do what they have experienced throughout their education, and we need to shift that that experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Joe, Joe, I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, we're being very cognizant of the time. I know I told you an hour. I know that people would listen to you for the next ten if I <laughs> allowed it, but there's only an eight hour limit on this. Uh, I, and it's, tell me if I'm wrong here, but this is the first time you've done a YouTube live, right? Because yes. you. Yeah, so like Joe is actually exhibiting what she models here because I, I just assumed she had done this a million times, uh, but this is the first time she did it. And, and so uh, I really appreciate you not only joining us, but modeling what you're talking about. And Thank so uh, and, and I, I will tell you when I asked you and I thought there's no way you're going to say yes to join. And then you said yes immediately. And I was dancing around and... <laughs> well, that was a little bit weird. Pretty big guy to do that. So uh, I'm just blown away uh, by the stuff that you share. And uh, I, I know that it's really made an impact on not only my learning, but the way that I see math education. And I know you've made an impact on so many people. So I just really want to thank you for your time tonight. And just such an awesome start to iMOOC. Yeah. Well, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, I, I will join in the iMOOC. Yeah, I might just stop it after tonight. So I don't want to... <laughs> Put any pressure. Like that. Uh, just if you could, Alice Keeler is going to be our guest next week, and she loves you. And so, oh, geez, awesome. I lost you for a second. Alice is and amazing. So if you can say something to her, that'd be awesome. I don't know yeah. If you lost me for a second. If you could say something to Alice, I'm sure she would love that because she idolizes you. It's amazing. I love Alice, and Alice yeah. is doing great things. Anyways, we look forward to uh, connecting, looking forward to your blog posts. Uh, you are more than welcome to blog about the prompts we gave you. Okay. Uh, but we bring awesome guests on like Joe, so that any of the stuff that she shared, you're more than welcome to blog about. We just want you, we just want you creating your own stuff and pushing yourself. So Katie, thank you so much. Joe, thank you so much. And everyone that took the time out of their nights uh, to, to watch this or is watching this later on. Thank you so much. We look forward to connecting with you. So thank you very much. Good night.